Rushing Wind Biker Church at 129 Knickerbocker Avenue in Bohemia, New York, the crossroad of freedom and faith. God bless you. Good evening. Good evening. How are we doing? Awesome. awesome. Um, I'm going to open a prayer, a couple of prayer requests. Uh, Jerry and Camille um, are on an emergency uh, visit. One of our friends in the motorcycle club. I uh, was in an accident earlier. Um, it's actually someone who's had a previous accident and had a long rehab. So besides the, um, you know, the obviously physical things that he's going to be dealing with, there's also the, the mental and emotional things of here we go again. You know, and um, someone, Jerry, Jerry is drawn very close to it, and uh, we're praying, and Jerry's praying that, um, that he's going to have the opportunity to lead this man to Christ. He's heard the story. He's been around us a lot. He's been here quite often. Um, very sweet guy. So keep him in prayer. Also, Pastor Spock is, uh, has got some kind of cold or flu or something. He's got high temperature and he's in bed, so Millie's taking care of him. So uh, when we start in prayer. Um, we want to lift them up. So let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, uh, we thank you, Lord, for, Lord, for uh, this family. Lord, we thank you for uh, the servants you've, you've sent to come alongside us, Lord. People like Jerry and Camille who are out doing your, your work, Father, uh, and uh, a member of our community uh, who's currently lost, Father, and we know that you're, you're reaching out to him. Uh, and our brother Spock, again, another mighty man of God who is uh, dealing with another physical challenge, Father. Lord, we just ask you to be with them right now. Do, do whatever ministering needs to be done, Father. Um, just empower those situations with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, uh, that hearts are moved, Lord, that uh, physical infirmities are moved. Uh, Lord, we know that you are the, uh, the holder of all life, the holder of all healing, and the holder of all salvation. And Lord, we just ask you to invade those spaces right now. Uh, Lord, for this evening, fill this place with a powerful anointing, Father. Lord, let, uh, let your Holy Spirit move freely from from ear to ear, heart to heart, soul to soul. Uh, Father, we want to get excited about who our God is. And Lord, that's our goal tonight, is to get excited about who our God is. We thank you for your Son, in whom we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about uh, the book of Romans for a while now. And uh, we're finishing up chapter 11. And chapter 11 really finishes a, a portion of the, uh, the book to Rome. And um, it closes the chapter on the gospel in a lot of different ways before Paul changes gears and, uh, and starts speaking on other things. Um, and, and Paul has really gone all out in, in several chapters explaining our, our faith, uh, explaining who we are not and who God is. Um, today we're going to concentrate a little later on actually who God is. Um, the book of Romans started with who we're not. And, uh, and hence the title really goes from the beginning of Romans is um, you're not God. So shut up. Because we all think we have control of our lives. We all want to have a say in this big picture. You know, and, and Paul really has, has gone through every layer of, of our faith through every layer of salvation. Um, and now he's going to talk a little bit about God. And, and the thing about um, man is man has always tried to figure God out. They're still trying to figure God out. Um, they're coming up with all ways to reach him from different directions. And they're also fabricating their own perceptions and their own gods. Um, some in the form of spiritualities, some in the, form, in the form of other actual gods. And, um, and so man is constantly looking and constantly searching for understanding. And, um, and, and I don't know about you, but do you want a God you could understand? Yeah. You do? Because if you can understand God, it means you have all the resources in you to be God. But what I'm saying is we can, we, can, we can know who God is, 
But the very statement of our faith, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Does anyone understand how a God so big could do something so outrageous? There's just no understanding that. You know, because God's love is broader than anything we can comprehend. You know, so man's, man's challenge is to walk in faith and be willing to not understand the whys. Sometimes I'd understand the hows because God is God and you're not. So we're not going to understand everything about God. You know, one of the power verses in Proverbs, which we we'll talk about a little bit later, is um, trust in the Lord thy God and lean not on your own understanding. Um, but we kind of do that all the time, don't we? We don't just lean on our understanding. When God does something or says something we don't understand, we get obsessed with having to understand it. And, and there are a lot of people that spend their whole lives trying to understand God, and they miss the joy of God, and they miss the peace from God, because the peace of, un, of, of God is a peace that is beyond understanding. But people are just constantly trying to figure this thing out. It's a challenge, and, and it's really what um, really confuses many people that are searching for faith. So God has, uh, has gone over all this whole discourse of our faith, and uh, he's talked about, you know, you're not, you're not righteous, no, not one. Um, the steps of salvation, which culminated a couple of weeks in, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then a couple of verses later, he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so now, in the end of this chapter, he's going to culminate the story. He's going to put an exclamation point on it. He's going to wrap everything up about this thing called understanding. Because uh, you're not going to understand God. You're not going to understand the gospel. You have to accept it. Because it doesn't make any sense. You know, we talked about how the gospel of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews. You know, the very gospel, the very savior we have is the stumbling block because the mind can't comprehend that God of creation would actually come down here, allow his creation to kill him, be a man, go into a grave, and come back. All right? That's lunacy. So the very thought of that complicates the thought of big God. And it also says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is foolishness to the Gentiles because they just, that doesn't even make sense. And, and so the thing is, God knows we're not going to understand them. Paul's trying to giving us, give us the encouragement that we don't have to understand him. And, and he starts in, uh, in verse 25 of Romans 11. He says, I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. Now this, this thing about being wise in your, own, in your own mind really covers two broad things. The first thing is we tend to want to be self-righteous when we have salvation and someone else doesn't. And so what Paul is dealing with is the Gentiles say, well, we're smarter than the Jews because they didn't get it and we understand it. Yeah. And so what happens is when you stand in a place where you think you're wise, you actually have created a gospel of works because you figured it out and now you're saved. And, and so Paul is trying to let the Gentiles know now it's, you're not that smart. You're just not that smart at all. And the Jews, on the other hand, they think they're wise because they have the Torah and they have the promises and they have big God and they have the Messiah that they're still waiting for and they have all wisdom, you know, the book of, of uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, much of the Old Testament is wisdom literature, not so much faith literature. So they believe they're wise in their own eyes. And God is saying, not so. Because I, I sent you the very Messiah that you have all the wisdom and knowledge to perceive as here, but you're just dumb. So don't consider yourself wise. Plus, the last level of this wisdom is the gospel itself and God's plan for humanity boggles 
the intelligence of the human mind. It does not make sense. When we think about God and his vastness and the smallness that we are. And so you can't figure it out. We cannot be wise. All right? The Bible has the wisdom to teach us the thoughts of God and how we can be wise in our working out of this humanity in this life. You know, a book of Proverbs is how to live a wise existence and make good decisions. But it doesn't make us as wise as God. It just makes us wise in the human realm. And we're still not going to understand why God sent his son. So, um, Paul now goes through this portion of scripture in verses um, 25 to 32, where he's kind of calling us out about he doesn't want us to be ignorant. And he doesn't want us to think that we're wise. That almost sounds like a contradictory statement, doesn't it? All right, but what Paul is saying back in, in Romans 11.25, I do not want you to be brethren uninformed of this mystery. So Paul is saying, I want you to understand it's a mystery. The gospel is a mystery. Uh, to the fact that why would God do that? And we have to start walking in faith and not trying to figure this thing out. Uh, there are a lot of people out there, like I said, they're looking for God. They're trying to figure God out before they step into a life that God has for them. They'll never do that because you eventually come to something that you don't understand uh, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So there's going to be something that doesn't make sense along the way. So Paul now winding down this conversation in, uh, in verses 29 to 32, he says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now you have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also who have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown you, that they may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up in all disobedience so that they may receive mercy. Anybody actually know what that means right now before I go through that? Okay. No? Okay. Um, this is the, the quandary we're dealing with. Uh, the Jews are God's chosen people. We know that. And, God, and Jews turned their back on God. But they're still God's chosen people. They just haven't seen it. So now, the Gentiles have received the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ because of the disobedience of the Jews. So God is using the disobedience of the Jews. It says in this portion of scripture there are enemies of the gospel. Right? So God is using the fact that Israel, who are still the chosen people, have turned their back on him to bring the Jews. And now God is using the Jews to cause jealousy so that the Jews now come back to be chosen also. Meanwhile, both of them are looking at each other and just thinking they're, they're, they're wiser than the other bunch. And so God, going back to uh, the beginning of, of Romans, which Paul is also saying here, um, you've all came from a place of disobedience. The Gentiles were just a disobedient people. The Jews have become a disobedient people. So God has put all of them together in a place of disobedience. So don't think you're so wise and shut your mouth and pay attention. This is what Paul is telling them here. Don't anybody think that you've got this figured out. Because my ways are bigger than your ways. And you'll never figure it out, so just accept it. You know, accept that the Jews are now able to come back. And he's gone through these, these different metaphors about um, Israel was the root. And it, the faith grew. And the people of God and the nation grew. And then they turned away and the branches broke off. So certain branches broke off and then the Gentiles had opportunity to be grafted in. And we spoke about this last week. The branches are still laying on the ground. They haven't been thrown in the fire. And so they have every opportunity to be grafted back in to the root. Or as Jesus put it, the vine and the branches. Now, two things I want to talk about here. 
Um, he says that the, the gift and the call are irrevocable. All right? Salvation is the gift of God. The nation of Israel are God's chosen people. They were given the gift of being God's people. Now, salvation has two aspects. It has the broad aspects of the nation, and it has the ind individual aspects of the individual people. That's why he said not all Israel is true Israel. All of Israel is still a blessed nation. They're still the people of God. But it has to be individual decisions of walking in faith with your heart instead of in your mind and in the, the works of the law. And the same thing with the new covenant. Right? God has given us a gift on the cross of salvation. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, these things are irrevocable. Now, what does that mean? That means that God has presented humanity with a gift. The gift of salvation and being his people. And God has placed the gift under the Christmas tree. Alright? Understand there are, there are spiritual truths within some things that we want to think is pagan and people throw this stuff on it. Alright? But God has given us a gift and he has wrapped it up and he's presented it to us. And every person in this world has been given a gift of salvation. Amen? I hope you realize that. Yes. The problem, we haven't opened the gift. But everybody has the gift. And it may take you all, all your life to get the gift because you have to open it up and receive it. Once you receive it, it, it's your possession forever. Once you accept Jesus Christ, your salvation can never be taken away from you. That is challenges in life, and we have our part to walk a victorious life. Yes. But once you have unwrapped the gift of salvation, and you've understood the gospel, it can never be taken away from you. But also, if that gift lays there under the Christmas tree for years and decades, your gift is still there. You know, I spoke about this this morning. My father gave his life to Christ six months before he died. He was kind of a godly man, but never really made the hard decision till later in life. And uh, the gift was laying there for his whole life. He was raised a Catholic. My mother began born again when I was 14. So there was a gift waiting for him. It was never taken away. You know, so it doesn't matter when you pick the gift up. And, and the thing about it, being God's ways are bigger than our ways. If we give someone a gift and we put it under a Christmas tree, you know, it's days go by and weeks go by, we know what's in the box, right? Months go by, years go by, decades go by, and you're looking at this gift and you know what's in it. Wouldn't we pick that gift up and give it to somebody else? Isn't that what we would do? It's going to waste. God's ways are bigger than our ways. And his gift is irrevocable. So every person in humanity has a gift that's waiting. It doesn't matter if it's a day. It doesn't matter if it's a week. It doesn't matter if it's a lifetime. It can never be taken away. As long as we have breath, we can pick the gift up, unwrap it. That's why when we, when we talk about people coming to Christ, we ask them, have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because it's receiving the free gift. But the gift is irrevocable. It's there and it can't be taken away even before you unwrap it and take possession of it. And if you're here today and you, you have the enemy that has spoken into your mind that, well, you know, what you did it wasn't real and you didn't really get saved. All right, that's why in here we try to make sure that people are educated and they get to that point that they make a decision they know is true. Because once you make that decision and you know it's true, it can never be taken away. But what's the first thing the enemy tries to do? So, you never did that. You're not good enough to keep the gift. You know, and all of a sudden he throws condemnation, he throws guilt, and all of a sudden we, we got these thoughts like, am I really saved? Do I have to say that prayer again? 
And if I say it again, do I have to like do more stuff so that this time it takes? And we've all seen people that go through these things. We have to understand that God is not an Indian giver. The gift is waiting. And it could be dusty, it could be under a tree, but God will never take that gift back. You know, so also remember that with everybody we know that isn't saved, you know, understand how we speak about these things because there are people out there that think God couldn't save me. I've done too many bad things in my life. So God, God just wrote me off and took the gift back and gave it to someone else because that can't be for me because I'm just too miserable a human being. You know, so we have to encourage people even that haven't come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ that no, the gift is there and it's free. All you have to do is unwrap it, understand what it is and receive it. Calling. You know your calling cannot be taken away from you? You know that. We all have a purpose in our life. We have a calling, something that God created us to do. Once you step into your calling, it can never be taken back. And actually, if you haven't come to Christ, God has a plan. You may never step into that plan, but he's not going to take it and give it to someone else because you didn't grab it. It's yours, no matter what happens. And, and there are some people that, you know, they, they start on fire for God and they start doing things and all of a sudden they get sidetracked and things, things happen. And um, We can be conned into believing that, well, I've lost the calling of God on my life. Not true. Once called, always called. It cannot be taken away. Now, if we misuse it and abuse it, God can place us on a shelf for a while. But he's not taking your gift away. So if you're here and you're in that position, be encouraged that you still have the vision for your life that God has. You still have the calling that God has for you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you are, no matter what goes through your mind. Because they cannot be taken away from you. They are yours. That salvation waiting is your salvation. It's not for anybody who might want to pick that up. It's waiting for you and you alone. Nobody can steal it on you. Nobody can be an imposter. And God's not going to take it away because it took you 60-something years. And it's still laying there getting dusty. And one thing I'm glad in my life is that the call that God had on my life, it took me almost 50 years. You know, and I got saved sometime before that. And never, you know, God's got patience. Amen? Amen. Patience. And it's not just that people won't perish. But it's a, it's, it's a matter of, I stepped into my call when I was almost 50. And we can look back and say, you know, those are wasted years. But no, because it was a preparation that needed to happen. All right? But he didn't take it away. You know, because when somebody feels their call has been taken away, what does it have to say to them for the rest of their life? I've made such a mistake that God can't use me the rest of my life. Example I brought up this morning. Uh, those who have been in church world for several decades, um, back in the 70s, um, there was a, a show and a movement called the PTL Club. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. You know, and it was, it was probably uh, charismania, television stuff at its worst. And so, God called him out, and he got condemned for what he was doing and the interesting thing is it wasn't what he was doing that was his fault it was another man of God on Long Island who had a movement here and a big church here that sent someone down an agent of Satan which actually brought down both ministries to some some effect I'm not going to go into details but if you remember back then you know, what happened. All right, Jim Baker ended up in a prison about three miles from my parents' house down in Jessup, Georgia. 
My father was part of the, the people that built that prison and was in prison just reflecting on his life. Now this guy made a big mistake, huge mistake, made a mockery of the gospel for a long time. You know, it was Prosperity Plus. Then it was Heritage Village. He wanted to create a Christian commune so everybody could go and we could be away from the world. You know, if you think about what Jesus was all about, that in itself is a demonic you know, call. You know, let's take all the Christians out of the world so we got all the light here and there's darkness out there with nothing shining in it. You know, let's all do that. That makes God happy, right? So anyway, Jim Baker now has a much smaller ministry. He's on television. He's on cable access and things like that. He's a broken, humble man. And he's still being used by God. In the same media, it's television, but he will even admit to you, I wasn't saved back then. And he stands in a place of humility, repentance, not in condemnation, but in knowing that God had to bring him to a place. Because now he's sharing the truth of the gospel, and now people are hearing the truth of the gospel, and his calling was never taken away. You know, men and women are human. We're going to do things. Now, is he under much more scrutiny? Absolutely. And with due, due cause. All right? And to be honest with you, um, as someone who's in ministry and a leader, I like scrutiny. I, I want scrutiny. Because if I go off a hair, I want to know about it. I don't want everything to be accepted as gospel and everything's exciting, so it must be true. And then one day I find myself not just a little bit off the road, but I'm in another country, in another world. But the point I'm making is God's calling is irrevocable. And many, many that we know, maybe some here, whatever you have felt called to do, and maybe you've messed up and the enemy's got you convinced that you can't do that anymore because you're disqualified. It's a lie from the pit. It's a lie from the pit. You know, God will pick you up. He'll put you on your feet. He'll dust you off. You draw close to him. He's going to make you brighter than you ever were. And your calling may actually be more empowered after the fact. That's also a possibility. See, all these things defy logic. You have to think, you know, God would think, okay, you, you really messed up. So, Jim, I, I could never put you out there again. Yeah, you just, you just wrecked everything. We would take his job away. We would be Donald Trump. You're fired. <laughs> wouldn't we do that yeah. you know but we're not God now to fire someone like that goes according to every logical thinking human being he should be fired and be never, never have the opportunity to be in that place again and in our thinking that would be the most righteous end of the story not just put him on a shelf strip him of any opportunity to do anything for God again because of what he did before. Now that's a big example. I think probably most of us have smaller examples of the same thing. And some of us have overcome those things. And we haven't believed the lie and we've gotten closer to Jesus and we've fixed those problems and now we're moving on. But there may be people here that, that are stuck in that place. And it doesn't have to be a huge calling. You know, your calling could be, you know, being the Christian person at work. But you, you slipped that day and now, you know, just F-bombs off the wall. And now the enemy's got you convinced your testimony is shot. Your testimony is shot. You know, that's kind of a more realistic thing that we can all relate to. Amen? Amen. You know? <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> but it's a lie from, it's a lie from hell. <coughs> You know, obviously there's things we have to overcome and sometimes we have to be in a place of humility and repentance to people we don't want to. But understand, your call is waiting for you. And so sometimes it takes the humble thing even to go to someone who's not saved. Because that's even a more powerful thing. Because we know in, in, in here, we, we forgive and we ask forgiveness and we have humility. But when you can show humility to someone of the world who's expecting the opposite and say, you know, I made a mistake. You know, I call me a hypocrite because in the moment maybe I was. 
And I'm sorry, and I, I gave you a wrong depiction of my, my God and my Lord. And then watch how that relationship and that whole thing changes. Your credibility goes off the charts when you can bring humility to the world and forgiveness to people who don't expect forgiveness and don't understand forgiveness. You'll find your call actually may be more empowered than ever. You know, that's kind of part of my story with this thing. Things I had to deal with and people that I, uh, and I hurt and stuff and I had to come back and, you know, do what I didn't want to do. But it changed something in me. And it made me a more humble servant. And that shows in a lot of different ways. And so all of a sudden your calling is not just restored, but it's empowered and it takes off in ways that you probably didn't even think you could before because of humility. Now, Paul is going to go from here and um, he's, he's completed the whole story of the gospel. He's told us about everything about our faith. He's talked about the Jews and the Gentiles and we're all equal and, and yes, they were God's people but now it's offered to you and he's given you all the information. And now he's, he's tried to, to let us know that this faith, this salvation cannot be taken away. That is the most rock solid thing you could ever put your faith in. And you can mess up. And you can't lose your salvation. And no matter how bad your life has been, the gift is waiting. It can never be taken away. And then Paul ends the rest of this chapter in really the important part of the whole gospel. And this we need to know because this empowers the entire gospel. Because if we don't know the God who has empowered the entire gospel, it takes away much of the power of the gospel. Amen? Amen. And so Paul is going to share a few things about how great is our God. Did we sing that one? Yep. Okay, we sang that one. Yeah. And so, just, just kind of Pay attention to how Paul puts things. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And we're going to do something real cool at the end of the service, which I believe is going to bring us to a place of really appreciation, worship, and understanding about just how awesome our God is. Verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of his wisdom and knowledge, the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. So he's making a broad statement about how big God is. And he, it's interesting because he, he uses a nautical term. You know, we know that uh, God separates our sins as far as the east is from the west. Right? We, we know that. And we know that neither depth nor height or anything can take us from the love of God we have in, in Christ Jesus. And, God, and Jesus is the Alpha and he's the, the Omega. And these are, you know, these are directions that have no end. They just go and they go. But here he uses something a little more visual. And what he's doing, he's, he's comparing the awesomeness of God to the seas and the oceans. You know, the seas and the oceans make up two-thirds of the earth. And when we stand at the shore of a sea or an ocean and look out, it just goes, it's, it's immense. And we kind of can get an idea of what huge is. But he brings it to another dimension when he talks about the depth. He brings it to a three-dimensional description because we can see the ocean as far as we can see and as far as we can see and as far as we can see. Now he's saying the depth is unfathomable. Um, people that know nautical terminology, a fathom is about six feet. And so he's saying in depth, it is unmeasurable. So it's giving a three-dimensional depth and broadness of how great not just God is, but His wisdom. Our wisdom doesn't scratch the surface of the waters. God is the vastness of everything you can't even see and the depth that you can never reach. And that's how big our God is. That's why this gospel that's not understandable he controls and he put in place and maybe we won't understand it 
But when we accept and understand how big God is, maybe we'll understand that we don't have to understand. Because I don't know about you, but I don't understand the love that God has. I, I try and I try and I try, and then you get something like this, well, how big God is. Why would he do that? When we see the pictures of what our Savior did. You know, he's that, and we're us, and he did that. So the understanding of that and the knowledge and the wisdom of God is so vast, we can't comprehend it. So the love God has for us, we're never going to comprehend. We don't have to. We just have to believe it and accept it. Just like the free gift. Because too many people are spending their time, even Christians, trying to figure God out. You know, why did this happen? Why, why did he do that exactly like that? There must be 17 layers beneath that we don't understand. So I'm going to go to commentaries, and I'm going to look word searches, and I'm going to go here and there, and I'm going to spend my whole life trying to figure God out and miss all the joy, miss all the peace, miss the purpose we had, because I'm so obsessed with trying to figure God out. And I think some of us have gone through those times. And we're wasting time. We're wasting time. Proverbs 3, 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your own understanding. And what I'm going to talk about here for a moment is something that may be one of the most evil, most despicable things that have been promoted in situations that the world is actually trying to help people. And this is something called the God of your own understanding. Now, I know there's people here that are familiar with that term because it's part of help groups and things like that. And I'm not telling people to not go to these things. What I'm telling you is bring what you have to those things. But a God of your own understanding will never have the power to take you out of the gutter and fix you. Because you've walked your life with your understanding. So a God that has your understanding can only do as good as you've done to this point. He could never get you out of it. You are the God of your own understanding. And I've said this, and it's not against formulas and, and meetings and stuff, because in their inception, the beginning, they were in their non-corrupt stage were from the Bible. But because of political correctness, getting more people, they changed it and they took all the power away from it. I don't want to have a God I can understand. Amen. I don't. That's useless. Because if I can understand it, I got all the information already. You know what I'm saying? And again, it's not coming against programs, it's coming against philosophy, because that's all it is, is philosophy. You know, the Bible talks in the Old Testament about, you know, a man cuts a, a branch off a tree, and he, he takes part of the branch, and he puts it in the fire, and he heats his house. And then he takes another part of that branch, and he puts it in the oven, and he breaks his, breaks his bread. And then he takes another part of the same branch and he whittles a little guy out of it and he puts it on a table and he washes it. It's the same thing that was burnt to cook his food and to heat his house. It's the same thing that in a matter of minutes is going to be nothing but a pile of ashes on the ground. That's the God of our own understanding. We don't want a God we can understand. God lets us understand his ways and he understand the process but we cannot understand what goes through the mind of a God that would actually do this stuff for someone as really insignificant as us you can't you can't, you can't figure it out don't bother be in such a place of gratitude and joy and, and peace that I'll take it you know if you went out and bought a lotto ticket tomorrow and won $250 million, are you going to sit there and... I don't know how this happened. Let me just figure the math. How many people... How many people... You know... I don't know how they did this. Uh, give me a calculator. You know, matter of fact, I want the names of all the people who didn't win so I can figure out why I won and they didn't win. No, we take the check and we run, right? Right? 
It's the same thing. If somebody did that, we would look at them as a moron. <laughs> They're a moron. I spent 10 years trying to figure out why I won. And the check's getting there, and probably the dog chewed it. They put it in the laundry, and now it's gone. You know? We have to stop trying to figure out God. In verses 34 to 35, it gives us a little bit of applications on that. He says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who became his counselor? Are we actually going to tell God how we should run the shop? Because that's what, what we do when we try to understand. I don't agree with that. You know, Lord, I can give you a hand with this one. You know, that one doesn't make sense to me. So this one makes more sense. Let's do things that way. You know, who, who is going to counsel God in the best way of doing things? Even if it doesn't make sense to us. It, it's sheer lunacy. You know, and we can laugh because we're in here and we get it. But there are people that are suckered in their whole life is falling apart and they're going to hell because they're falling into this stupidity of trusting other things than the God that will make life incredible without having to figure all the details out. And then he says, or who has first given to him that he might be paid back? This is works. It's like I can, I can, I can figure out what I got to do to make God happy with me. You know, I can go to church. I can tithe. I can, I can, I don't know. Maybe go out and, and help the poor a little bit. You know. And like God's up there with the chalkboard. Oh, oh he's got seventeen things this week. Yeah. Yeah. I'm rolling. You know. Or you look at other faiths because that's all other faiths saw. You. You get on your face and, you, and you, you, you pray towards Mecca five times a day. You know why they do that? Because that God is the one that was whittled out of wood. And the one that's just going to be ashes when everything is said and done in the end. You know? When we understand there's nothing we can do to make God happy except accept the gift. That's all it is. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can say. We can't outthink God. We can't tell him how to run the shop. You know, he's got a lot more experience in that than us. And um, we're going to end a little bit differently today. Is that okay? Yep. Hmm? <laughs> I want everybody to stand up. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read you verse 36. But before I read it, I'm going to tell you a little story. Has anybody ever heard of John Piper? And Piper was a pastor, a theologian. Um, was, was a teacher in a Bible college. And he was finishing a semester. He was finishing the last class of the semester. And he was a teaching on Romans. And he got to the last verse on the last day and the last moment in class. And he started doing diagrams on the board of the gospel and God and everything else. And he got to the point where he was doing a a drawing or, or an illustration with this verse. And by the time he got to the end of the verse, the class was all standing and singing. This is verse 36. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is called a doxology. It's a statement and a profession of how great and how big and how awesome our God is. How many people are familiar with the doxology from church past? Right? Does that mean that you know you were here this morning? Yeah. All right. <laughs> you know, there's things there's things that have been done in denominational Christianity that at their core was a perfect way to do what had to be done or say what had to be said. And sometimes as the weeds of corruption in Christianity overgrow them, you lose the purity of those things that become hidden. And so we're going to sing the doxology. If you're out of the Catholic faith, and maybe others, you will recognize it as soon as we start singing it. Okay? And we're going to sing it twice. First for those who don't know it. And then we're going to sing it 
with all our heart and all our soul, and we're going to bless God today. Amen? Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now we're going to sing it again. And I want you to strip everything you've known about that in the past. Because when I started putting this message together, I had flashbacks of sitting in a Catholic church with a big crucifix and the oppression of the nuns and everything else. And I had to fight through. And I had to strip everything of that. Just pay attention to the words and sing this towards a God that is bigger than we could understand. Can we do that? And then we're going to sing our song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. See, Paul has just given the whole story of our faith. And he's just explained the God that empowers that gospel. And we need to appreciate the vastness and the power and the just unreachable love and compassion and wisdom and knowledge that our God has. And praise Him. Amen? Amen. Let's sing a song. What do you think, Johanna? Yeah? I know Johanna wants a song. And then we're going to pray and we're going to close. done deal these are pretty okay <laughs> for those who know David King member of the Enders Motorcycle Club is now a member of the Body of Christ amen <laughs> <sighs> he opened the gift tonight amen fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand and he's riding a white horse across this land he has fire in his eyes and the sword in his hand he's riding a white horse all across this land and he's calling out to you and me you ride with me. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. And he's riding a white horse across this land. He's calling out to you and me. You ride with me. Will you ride with me? We say yes. Yes. No. We'll ride with you. And we say yes, Lord. We will stand up and fight. the crown on his head he carries a scepter in his hand he's leading the armies all across this land and he's calling out to you and me we 
This fellowship, this church, is a, is a blessing in, in ways that you don't even realize to us that are in ministry. Um, most of the motorcycle ministries, even Bikers of Christ around the country, they don't have a, a rushing wing church. You know, we have people come in here from all walks of life, and we see people get saved, and we see young people, and we see old people. And, you know, there are people that are just doing bike ministry. You don't know how many thousands and thousands of hours of sharing and crying and loving because every hour we put in with someone in the bike community out there the enemy's putting thousands of hours into that same person trying to strip of what we just did and so I just want to thank you and God for bringing you because it makes our job bearable out there 